Okay, folks, welcome to the second part uh, of our discussion about the philosophy of race and gender. Uh, so in our last little segment, we looked at Quaishan Spencer's paper about race. Uh, now we're going to look at Elizabeth Barnes's uh, paper, uh, The Metaphysics of Gender, uh, which I've taken out of the same textbook uh, as uh, the Spencer paper, uh, the Norton Introduction to Philosophy, second edition. Uh, so uh, we are going to think about, uh, again, a question about metaphysics, right? And metaphysics is a subject matter that deals with questions about what is real, uh, what does actually exist, what actually exists in the world, um, and uh, you know what sorts of assumptions we have to make about the nature of reality when we say that uh, it's true that a certain person is you know of a particular race or of a particular gender. So, uh, you know, a helpful thing that Barnes does is she starts her paper off uh, just by giving us some cases to think through. Uh, so he, she mentions uh, gender queer people. Uh, so a person, for instance, who identifies as neither gender in particular. Uh, so they don't identify as uh, a man or a woman, uh, even if they are uh, biologically uh, female, um, as in the case of Ama uh, in Barnes's paper. Uh, we can also uh, think about people who are trans men and women. Uh, so trans people are people who identify as a gender that they weren't assigned at birth. Um, and, you know, sometimes they also have uh, certain biological characteristics. So they might have a lot of secondary uh, sex characteristics of people who aren't trans uh, because they take uh, hormonal supplements, and sometimes they have anatomical surgery, uh, but sometimes they don't have anatomical surgery, as in the case of uh, Ben uh, that Barnes gives. You know, this is a person who is a trans man, uh, but who still has uh, some anatomical features that are still uh, characteristically female. Uh, we can then think about uh, people who are non-conforming people uh, within a gender. So they might be identified as the gender that they were assigned at birth, uh, but they don't participate uh, in many of the norms associated with their gender. Uh, so there, Barnes gives the case of Chia, and Chia is uh, a non-conforming woman. So she identifies as a woman, and more specifically as a butch lesbian, uh, as Barnes puts it. Um, and in many cases, uh, she is uh, mistaken for a man uh, because of the way she dresses and acts in certain contexts. Uh, but we think of Chia still as a woman. Um, and then... Uh, the last case that Barnes has us think about is a person with androgen insensitivity syndrome. Uh, so this is uh, one way of being an intersex person. Uh, you know, intersex is a biological category, uh, just meaning that a person has certain biological traits that are between uh, male and uh, female in the ways that they are uh, characteristically uh, patterned. Uh, but in the case that Barnes has us consider, uh, it's a person who has uh, typically female sex characteristics, uh, but who has XY rather than XX chromosomes. So uh, the thing that Barnes points out here is that we need to make a distinction between sex and gender. And the really simple view of sex and gender is just the view that uh, 
uh, women have XX chromosomes and men have XY chromosomes, uh, and that's all there is to it. Uh, but as we've already seen, uh, Barnes points out that biological sex is complicated. Uh, so while typical biological males have XY chromosomes and higher levels of testosterone and testes, uh, and while it's true that typical females have XX chromosomes and higher levels of estrogen and not to mention progesterone uh, and have ovaries, it's also case, the case that these traits are combined in different ways. Uh, so in the case of somebody with AIS, that person has XY chromosomes um, and testes, uh, but they also have higher levels of estrogen and uh, externally, uh, visually, uh, more characteristically female uh, traits. Uh, so a case of somebody like Dina, who has AIS, uh, raises a bunch of complications for the view that uh, sex is just a matter of chromosomes. Because uh, it would seem that Dina uh, is a woman. Uh, at least that's how she's identified. That's how everybody treats her. You know, she would never think to use a men's bathroom uh, because uh, she spent her entire life using a women's bathroom um, and everyone's been fine with that. Uh, Barnes also points out that uh, our gender concepts also involve a lot of assumptions about a person's personality and what they should be like simply on the basis of sex characteristics. So the idea is that there's a certain kind of social significance uh, that we place on a person's falling into a certain biological category. You know, so it might be the case that uh, these gender differences uh, get sort of turned into roles. So the thought here is that people tend to think that certain gender differences um, can be explained in terms of sex difference. Uh, so, you know, we start making assumptions about people about whether they're nurturing or whether they talk a lot or whether they're emotional or good at abstract reasoning uh, just on the basis of uh, whether they have male or female uh, secondary sex characteristics. Um, you know, we don't do this to people uh, when it comes to, you know, a person's having, you know, brown eyes rather than blue eyes, right? Uh, and Barnes suggests here that uh, sex differences are often overblown when we try to explain the difference between different kinds of people. Um, so it's just an overblown claim to think that, uh, you know, men are always logical and women are always emotional, uh, given that everybody falls onto a spectrum. Uh, and even if there are some biological differences, uh, they might be a lot less significant than we take them for. So if you consider the example of height, it is true that men on average are taller than females. So when I say males are taller than females, I mean on average, uh, but not by a lot, right? You know, the average man, I think might be like five foot 10 and the average woman might be like five foot five. Uh, so that's not a huge height difference. Um, and we can also realize that there are plenty of women who are taller than plenty of men. Uh, so there are plenty of women who are taller than the average man uh, there are plenty of men who are shorter uh, than the average woman. Uh, and the other thing that Barnes is going to point out, that it's hard to accept this view that uh, gender roles or characteristic behaviors or stereotypes are based simply in biology, uh, because many cultural stereotypes vary from culture to culture. Uh, so it might be thought that like pink is a feminine color in 21st century North American society, uh, but there might be other societies where that's not the case. Or uh, as Barnes points out, uh, 
in 19th century England, uh, it was thought that men are more emotional than women. And in fact, they thought that it was a superiority of men uh, that they had more depth of feeling. That was their way of thinking about it. Uh, you know, in contemporary culture, it's often thought that men are the stoic, rational ones, and women are the ones who are always emotional. Uh, so these differences, uh, you know, at least somebody has to be wrong, and these stereotypes probably aren't really tracking anything uh, that's built right into uh, our genetics or our bodies. Uh, and then Barnes also points out that uh, gender roles and the distinction between uh, sex and gender is needed to understand uh, transgender people. Uh, so Barnes thinks that it's implausible to deny that transgender men are men. Uh, and the way that she puts it is that it's a confusing claim and it's possibly inconsistent with other things that a person thinks. Uh, given that uh, being a man doesn't mean that you have to have every single uh, typical male sex characteristic. Uh, and she thinks it would be implausible or inconsistent to deny that a transgender man is a man, uh, but to you know assert that Dina, somebody who has AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome, uh, is a man. Uh, so that leads us to a question, right? The question is roughly, well, if gender isn't a matter of biology, well then, what the heck is it? And one hypothesis is that it's a set of social norms, uh, such that you can consciously accept or reject your gender. Uh, Barnes points out that this doesn't quite square with the fact that human societies have systematically and consistently classed people into genders based on anatomical sex characteristics. Uh, and this systematicity is sort of inconsistent with the hypothesis that uh, gender is just something based on the beliefs of individuals that they made up. So she says, you know, in order to work out a theory of how gender might be a social phenomenon, uh, you might take two different ways of thinking about it. One is to say that gender is determined by your own internal sense of yourself. And another approach is to say that gender is determined primarily by how other people react to you. So let's think these two views through. Now, Barnes has us look at a view from Sally Haslanger, uh, which is also briefly discussed in Quaishan Spencer's paper about race. Uh, so here's the view there. It's the idea that a person is a woman if and only if. Now in the paper, it actually says IFF. That's just sort of like a little philosophy logic shorthand to mean if and only if. But it's basically saying that uh, in every case somebody meets the three conditions that we're going to look at, then they always count as a woman. So here's what Hasslinger says. She says they're a woman if and only if uh, they are regularly and for the most part observed or imagined to have certain bodily features presumed to be evidence of a female's biological role in production. Uh, so if a person is observed or imagined to have, say, a uterus or to have uh, breasts, uh, then that means that they are going to be perceived to have those bodily features. Two, uh, that S has these features marks within the dominant ideology. So, you know, like the gender roles uh, and sort of like the normative concepts that we have for each other as someone who ought to occupy certain kinds of social positions that are, in fact, subordinate and motivates and justifies uh, S's occupying such a position. And then finally, 
the fact that S does satisfy 1 and 2 uh, plays a role in uh, that person's systematic subordination in society, i.e. along some dimension S's social position is oppressive and S is satisfying. 1 and 2 plays a role in that person's being subordinated. Uh, so the idea here is that gender, so somebody's gender, you know, like being a man or a woman, is the social significance that we attach to a person's being a member of a certain sex. But Barnes has some worries about this view. Uh, for one thing, she says that this theory would suggest that a trans woman who doesn't pass as a woman, that is, you know, maybe people uh, are aware that this person uh, doesn't have uh, the ability to reproduce, uh, means that they do not actually count as a woman. Um, there's still a question if uh, you know, this person passes as a woman with some people, but not as a woman with others. Uh, another strange consequence of this view is that it says that uh, women would not be women if they weren't oppressed. Uh, because on Hasslinger's view, uh, being perceived as a woman uh, plays a role in that person's systematic subordination. Uh, is part of what it is to be a woman. Uh, so Barnes gives the example of the Amazons in uh, Greek mythology who were like a powerful class of warrior women. Well, they aren't oppressed, so therefore they don't count as women. Now, maybe Hasslinger is actually fine with this view. Uh, she actually does say that uh, what we would hope for in society is that people are not perceived or made subordinate uh, on account of the bodily features that they have that play a role in reproduction. So, you know, in a perfect world, uh, nobody would have a gender uh, on Hasslinger's view. Uh, they would just be people, as it were. So, if we get rid of this externalist view of gender, how others perceive you, you might go for an internalist view of gender, which is going to say that uh, what makes you the gender that you are, uh, is it just that uh, you identify with that gender? So whether that be identifying with the gender man or woman, or whether you identify as genderqueer or agender. Uh, so it's sort of like an internally felt sense of your relationship to the gender norms and categories that are common within your society. But Barnes worries about this view as well, that it's hard to establish that all members of a certain gender are having uh, the same experiences as other members of that gender. Uh, so is it the case that every man has the same internally felt sense of what it is to be a man, uh, or that every genderqueer person has a particular internal sense that's different from that which is felt by agender people. Uh, moreover, uh, you know, there's this idea that's sort of common in circles of thinking about gender of intersectionality. And it basically says that the experience um, and the lived conditions of, you know, being a woman are going to be different for different women. So if you thought about, you know, the experience of upper class Latino women as compared to the experience of working class black women, uh, they're going to have different experiences of what it is to be a woman. Uh, so the thought is we might need too much similarity between all women uh, for this view to actually work. Uh, Barnes also points out that it implausibly suggests that 
women with severe cognitive disabilities aren't really women. So, you know, maybe the way to go is to go back to an externalist approach and make gender about how others perceive and interact with you rather than how you perceive yourself. Uh, so just to sum up, uh, Barnes rejects uh, a simple, straightforward identification between biological sex and gender, uh, but she finds problems, or at least complications, uh, with both internalist, how others perceive you, and internalist, how you perceive yourself, accounts of the social construction of gender. So what she says towards the end of her essay is, what we're left with is a lot of confusion. It's both philosophically and politically important that we understand what gender is. But the project of understanding gender is very hard. We're pulled in many different directions, and there are many different, sometimes conflicting, aims for our theories. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you want a theory that makes sense of the gender of people with severe cognitive disabilities, or making sense of transgender people, and their experience, uh, you might have different aims. And so Barnes concludes that as it stands, it doesn't seem like there's any one theory of gender that explains everything we want a theory of gender to explain. So I guess that's uh, what I'll leave it to you to ponder a little bit, is what's the most important thing that we want a theory of gender to explain? Um, and we might also wonder uh, which theoretical approach uh, makes the most sense to you. Is it this internalist view? Is it this externalist view? Um, do you think that Barnes's objections to a biological connection between sex and gender is the way to go? Yeah. So um, that's going to wrap it up for our discussion of uh, the philosophy of sex and gender. Of course, we could spend an entire course uh, thinking about these issues, but uh, in this course we're only going to be able to look at this one paper uh, because we've run out of time. But uh, hopefully uh, this gives you a sense for some of the issues that uh, philosophers of sex and gender uh, are trying to make sense of. So thanks for listening in uh, and take care.